lovely Tuesday afternoon. So on behalf of the Society, our senior patron, uh, Provost Patrick Prendergast in Trinity College Dublin, thank you for joining us this afternoon to welcome the Society's newest recipient of the Gold Medal of Honorary Patronage, David Yates. So each year, the Council and members of the Phil elect a select number of exceptional individuals to the honour of honorary patronage in recognition of their outstanding and significant contributions to their given fields. Born in England, David Yates is a director of film and television, best known for directing the final four films in the Harry Potter franchise. His first two Potter films, Order of the Phoenix and Half-Blood Prince, became the highest grossing entries in the series after the first instalment, which was later surpassed by Yates' uh, Deathly Hallows, making him the most commercially successful British director in recent years. He is the only director in the series to be honoured with a Best Director accolade for his work on Harry Potter. Yates directed Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, due to for release uh, next month, and will also direct its sequel. He achieved international attention for his award-winning short films early in his career, which led him uh, becoming a prolific television director with credits including the BBC costume drama The Way We Live Now, the acclaimed political thriller State of Play, and the BAFTA-lauded two-part drama Sex Traffic. Due to the success of these dramas and subsequent projects, Yates is considered as one of Britain's most celebrated directors of film and television. Throughout his works, Yates uses handheld cameras to visually provoke the subject matter. The technique is noted as one of his directorial trademarks. So without any further ado, we invite you to please stand as we welcome our newest society medalist, David Yates. pleasure to be here and I finished the film on Friday a film called Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them that's coming out in about seven weeks and we've been working on this film for two years seven day weeks um, late nights early mornings if anyone wants to be a film director by the way and you don't like early mornings don't become a film director <laughs> um, and I said to Steph and Ben in my office actually when we got to the end and we finally finished the last bit of grading on the print. I said, I think I'm going to go to bed for a week. And Steph said, no, you've got to go to Ireland. You've got to go to Ireland because they're going to give you an award. And um, I thought about it for five minutes because I, I wondered if I'd be able to get over here without falling asleep because it's been such an intense period. And I looked at some of the people that you've honoured and it's truly impressive and amazing the people you've celebrated in this space. And I feel very privileged to be on that very, very long list of very special people. And it made me think, why on earth do they want to honor me? Why on earth do they want to add me to this very esteemed list of eclectic, talented, graceful people? And it makes you reflect upon life. It makes you reflect on your career. It makes you reflect upon what you've done with your own work and with your own life. It makes you think quite hard about it and what you have left to achieve. And um, I started, when I was about 13 years of age, I decided I wanted to be a film director. And at 13 years of age in St. Helens near Liverpool where I grew up, saying you wanted to be a film director was a bit like saying I want to be an astronaut or, or a nuclear physicist. People in our street didn't do it. You know, it was one of those <coughs> sort of crazy things that you had to aspire to do. And my mum, who was very sweet and very kind, had seen me wandering around the house with a Swan Vesta matchbox. And I'd taken the middle out, and I was just looking through it like this, <laughs> sort of constructing frames in my head. And I wanted to tell stories. And I started with this matchbox. And so she said, I'll give you a camera. I'll buy you a camera. So she bought me a second-hand camera for 14 quid. And that's where my filmmaking career really began. 
when I was a teenager, basically. And I think the reason I wanted to tell stories is because I found it really difficult to... I was a very sort of geeky, slightly isolated kid. So telling stories, making films, was a way of communicating and reaching out to the world. For me, it, it was, my, was my way of expressing myself. You know, I lived with a, my mum, who was quite shy and sort of quite isolated. And um, I had a couple of very close friends, but I used the medium of film and storytelling to try and communicate and to express. And that's been a sort of journey that I've taken pretty much throughout my career. And then I went to university, got a degree in government and politics, and I went to film school and I studied directing at the National Film and Television School. And my career really started when I, when I made a film called When I Was a Girl, which I wrote and directed. And what happened is I brought it to a film festival in Ireland, at the Cork Film Festival, and it got recognised and won a big prize at Cork. And in a way, that was really the beginning of my career. So it's really interesting to be here accepting another award in Ireland when really Ireland was the first place I got my start. It was the first beginning, if you like, of <coughs> filmmaking career. And um, when I started making films, it was really all about the technology. It was about the lenses. It was about the camera. It was about the way you move the camera. It was about the kind of tripod that you got. As a geeky kid growing up in the north of England, it was about the technology. And the technology is what got me excited about making films. And then as I got a bit older, and I lived a bit of life, my interest moved from the technology and the stuff and the gear, and it started to move to human beings and the stories that we need to tell each other and the experiences that we have as we move through our lives. And the gear became much less important, the lenses I was using. These all became tools in a way to interpret our lives and what they mean um, and to communicate what it is to live a life and to deal with life in all its many facets. And so as I got older and I made more and more things, I became more and more obsessed with communicating and expressing to each other what we deal with on a daily, weekly basis in our, in, when drama strikes our own lives. And Mark, my editor, and I, the other week, as we finished the movie, for the very first time did something we've never, ever done before. The studio do this thing. I work for a studio called Warner Brothers. <coughs> and to give you some indication, <coughs> to give you some indication of how your movie is playing with an audience, it was very weird. They sometimes film the audience. And so I said to Mark, my editor, I said, you know what? I know this sounds really odd. We should just watch this film of the audience watching our film to see how it's playing, to see how it's working in certain sections and certain sequences. And we thought we'd probably watch about a minute of this tape of the audience watching Fantastic Beasts. And we started watching it, and we couldn't stop watching it. Because what was fascinating was how a group of people in a room, in the dark, together, in a way, experienced a collective, exper a collective emotional experience. And it was profoundly moving to see how people would tune into an emotional moment or a moment of comedy and they would share these moments in the dark together. And it was really, Mark and I, we've been working together, we're a bit like a married couple, we've been working together now for nearly 15 or 20 years. And we were really moved by the fact that the power of storytelling and the power of communication is, was there in front of us as we watched 500 people watch our movie. And, um, and it took me right back to being a kid in Liverpool, growing up, realizing that what I wanted to do when I started out was to communicate, was to reach people with the stories that were told. And as we watched this tape of this bunch of people in Burbank watching our film, you realize the power of the medium and the power of cinema and how important it is now more than ever to share stories and to reach out to people and to, let, to encourage people to recognize that we all share whichever culture we're in, whichever country we grow up in, we have very, we're, we're, we have a common humanity. And for me, the power of film is ultimately the fact that we can, we can share our stories. And when we share our stories, we watch those stories together as a collective. 
We watch it as a group. We watch it in the dark, hundreds of us. And, we, and what's fascinating is, as you watch these people from different cultures, you realize what binds us together is this common humanity, is a common experience. And for me, <coughs> having moved from lenses and tripods and bits of gear, <coughs> I'm now fascinated about how, going forward, the stories I want to tell with Fantastic Beasts moving on and all the other films I want to make need to deal with how we start to appreciate and connect and understand the other, the things that we don't understand in life. So in a way, it's lovely to get this, and I'm very proud to get this, and I'm very grateful <coughs> for you inviting me here. Um, but I only, I feel I probably might earn it in another 10 or 15 years' time, because I'm only about halfway through, <laughs> frankly. Um, so it's a down payment. <laughs> And what I'll do is I'll use it. I'll use this as I, I, I think I'll hopefully earn this in about 15 years' time when I've completed the other half of my career. And, um, and this will be my inspiration as I go forward to, um, to push myself and push the people around me to do the best work that we can. Because ultimately we're here to do the best we can with whatever we have. And uh, this will help me do just that. So thank you very much for this. Thank you very much. Uh, so David, welcome to Dublin, first of all, and uh, welcome to the film. Uh, thanks so much for accepting the award, and we'll, I made a note to uh, get back in touch in 15 years <laughs> to invite you again. Uh, and thank you as well for your really insightful speech. Um, so now we're going to move into a question and answer session. Um, so I'm going to get the ball rolling, so I'll ask a few questions, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. So if you have any questions, maybe start thinking about them now. Um, so just to start, so yeah. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them is out next month. Yeah. So after having directed half of the Harry Potter series and being the director, most strongly identified with the franchise. Mm. How does it feel to return to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter? Uh, do you feel the pressure to live up to the previous films or does it feel like a whole new beginning? It's a combination of all of the above. Um, they sent, Joe sent me the script um, and David Heyman who produces the movies. Um, and <coughs> I was a bit reticent about going back because I'd spent six years making four Harry Potters. It's, a, it's quite a, an investment of time. And, and when I got the script, I was expecting it to be a little bit like Harry Potter, quite frankly. But what it shares with Harry Potter is Jo's um, instincts for characters. She creates these amazing characters who are really utterly charming and identifiable. They feel like someone you know or, some, or, or they have an aspect a part of you in them somehow, and they're universal. So that they ha it had that quality. It also had a very life-affirming philosophy of life, which is, you know, basically accept otherness, be yourself, express yourself. All the values that exist in those books exist in this screenplay. But it's a whole new set of characters. It's a whole new world, New York, 1926. And it felt different. And I sometimes equate it to having you know if you go to a favorite place to eat, you have a favorite restaurant that you love, and you go in there and you love the place where you sit, and you have a window with a view, and you look out and you see your favorite tree, and you've got your favorite waiter who comes up and he's really lovely, and you always have a good laugh with him. So it's a bit like that, and then he brings you a meal that you've never had before. And it's something you've never eaten in that restaurant. It just feels different and fresh and interesting. So it's a combination of things, Ult ultimately, it's something that's familiar, but feels very, <laughs> feels very, very new. Um, and the script was just very funny, very charming. And in terms of living up to what we've done before, I always look back and think we could have done better, frankly. I always look back and go, well, that was good, but could we have pushed it further? So I never, and anyone who worked on those movies never ever rested and felt, God, we really nailed it. Do you know, we always felt it was a good film, it was solid, it was interesting, or it was fun. Or we, so in terms of having an opportunity to push it further, it, it felt like a perfect opportunity to, to push the world further. 
Thank you. And um, so Harry Potter is obviously a hugely popular series that attracts a seriously devoted fan base. Yes. So when you were making the films or were directing the films, how did you how did you find the balance between satisfying the hardcore fans but also appealing to the average film goer that would want to see the film? It was always tricky because we'd always leave out bits that people loved in the books and we always got hammered for that to a certain degree. Um, but you had to sort of find a format and, and, a, and a way of adapting those stories that would work within the cinema. And uh, there's a lovely writer called Steve Clovis I work with a lot. Another writer called Michael Goldenberg who did the fifth film that I did. And it was a process of, um, it was a process of balance, frankly. And the thing about the books is they were so generous. They were so stuffed full of beautiful things. It was a bit like going into a beautiful room like this, full of books, and just choosing your favorite ones, and taking them back and, 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 and reading those. So, um, and ultimately, some fans were frustrated with the things that we left out, and some fans were delighted with the things that we put in. Um, the great thing about Fantastic Beasts is there isn't a, a book, <laughs> you know. Uh, so there are no expectations. Nobody's going to go, you left that bit out, or what happened to that sequence, or you couldn't have left that character out. And the great thing about Fantastic Beasts is it's all coming from Joe's imagination. And she's like a volcano at the moment. It's kind of spooling out these stories, these characters. And in a way, these are the, this is the next iteration for her. The, the Harry Potter books, now Fantastic Beasts, she's taking that imagination and she's, she's funneling it into these screenplays. And, and nobody gets to read the things that we cut out because we, <laughs> we cut them out before the screenplays issued. So we sort of have a... I was working with Joe last week and Steve. We're developing the second screenplay. And it's a very dynamic process of refining and, and, and moving the script forward. And the lovely thing is people will s experience her stories for the very first time in the cinema, which will be a very different experience to having a relationship with a, 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 set a, a whole story and then seeing it adapted. So hopefully there'll be less frustration at times. Thanks. And then just a final question from me, but um, who are your biggest influences as a director and how do you think that affects your work? You mentioned earlier that you... Uh, you focus on social issues within some of your, your previous work that you did yeah. on, on TV, but um, who would be the kind of biggest directors um, that have affected? I love Ken Loach's work. Ken Loach made all these wonderful, as you know, he's a gifted, wonderful... He, his, his early work really sort of um, inspired me. Martin Scorsese, just simply because his te technical abilities are extraordinary. And I love Steven Spielberg's early work. And, and actually, his body of work is extraordinary just the things that he's managed to achieve, and his, his popular reach um, has always impressed me. So it's an, an odd combination, Spielberg, Scorsese, and Ken Loach, um, and they're the, they're the biggest influences as I started out making films. Sure. Uh, so we're going to open it up to the audience, audience now, so if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask, please raise your hand. We'll go to Laura. Do you know, uh, I guess I was really proud of what Dan did in the fifth film, you know, when he was going through all that teenage angst. And I really pushed Dan a, a, a good deal in that, in, in Order of the Phoenix. Um, and then Tom in Half-Blood Prince plays Draco Malfoy. Again, you know, the, those characters are quite sort of straightforward in some ways. They're very quick reads. Certainly Malfoy, the young Malfoy is. And it's a very quick read in those earlier stories and taking him on a slightly more troubled journey in the sixth film was was really fun and it was really i think tom pushing tom and encouraging him to dig deep and find edges and sides to that character that felt what i wanted the audience to do was to relate <coughs> to him to sort of empathize with him to try and understand what he was going through um and for sort of like the bad guy or the bad kid, I thought that would be a very interesting thing to do. And so I think, yeah, Tom in, in Half-Blood Prince, um, on that journey where he's charged with assassinating or helping assassinate 
Dumbledore was was quite an enjoyable thing to do because you're taking what is essentially an archetype and you're trying to sort of find l more light and shade within it. And Tom, what was lovely about working with all those young actors at that point and throughout those four films is you they would always come to the floor with such ambition and enthusiasm. You know, yeah, as, as younger actors do, they're so... On the one hand, you had your Maggie Smiths and, you know, the old-school actors who were... You, who you had to sort of establish a different kind of relationship with. And the thing about Dan, Rupert, Emma, they always, they always brought so much good energy to the floor because they always wanted to be pushed and they were always very curious. And they'd always try a, a note, however eccentric it might be, to just push themselves, uh, ultimately. Um, but yeah, I would say Tom in Half-Blood Prince. Yeah. Yeah, any other questions? It was the, it was the, the book was so long, and um, <laughs> that was, and we kept, everyone kept telling us off, everybody kept telling us off for leaving bits out, and so we thought we might be able to get more in, um, and the first half of the book, as we started to develop the screenplay, it was very evident that the first half of the story was very melancholic and a bit haunted and a bit kind of poignant and, and quiet, and then the second half was kind of big and blockbustery and with lots of action so they just felt like two very different stories to me and two very different films so it was partly to get more in so we could include as much as possible and it was partly to um to make two slightly different movies and i still can't believe we got away with the first one because the first one is you know, it's very melancholic, you know, and it's three kids in a tent for two hours, <laughs> you know, having tea. And, you know, and I remember I took it to the studio, I took it to Warner Brothers um, to present it for the very first time, and I thought, they're going to kill us, man. This is like a two-hour movie with Dan Rupert and Emma just wandering around the countryside having a chat. And, um, and uh, I said, look, I know it's two hours, four minutes, or whatever it is, I can take about five minutes out, you know, if, if you just think it's going on too long. And they were really sweet. They said, no, 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 put more in. Put more wandering around the countryside in. <laughs> we don't mind. Put as much wandering around the countryside as you like in. And, um, and then I really wanted to do a, more of a fireworks show with the second film. That was much more of a, an opportunity to, to have closure. And one of, the, one of the challenging things about all of those movies is that they were always, in a way, chapters en route to a finale. Do you know what I mean? So you'd make a movie and you'd always have a little bit of closure at the end, but it was always an end that had a dot, 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 dot. You know, and what was really enjoyable about the last movie is it had a full stop. You know, it had a, it had a final, it had a finality about it that was really enjoyable. Um, so that's the reason. We just wanted to, you know, enjoy as much of the material as possible and make two distinctly different kinds of films. Well, I don't know. It's um, just there's, there's a lot of talent here, I would suggest. And um, I worked with Colin Farrell on Beasts, and he's, a, he's amazing, generous, lovely man. And why is it? I don't know what you do here, what your training um, is in this country, but it, it produces soulful, interesting artists. And... Um, and actually film actors rather than TV actors in my experience. Um, when you turn a camera on, a, on an actor, you know, there are some people express, illustrate, describe what they're doing. And, you know, the Irish actors I've worked with, they tend to be, you know, they tend to sort of find that vernacular of being um, just more naturally sometimes. Um, and there's something you know, something compelling about that. Um, and, yeah, I don't know how you do it, but you, you seem to, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of talented people who come out of Ireland um, that I've really enjoyed working with, you know. Yeah, so keep doing it.
<laughs> Keep coming. Um, quite a bit, actually. Um, I'm, James Newton Howard has written the music for Fantastic Beasts, and Alexander Desplat worked on The Potters, the latter two. Um, actually, and recently I've had, I, I used to be really um, anally involved in the whole process in the sense that I would, I would literally, you sit and you spot the movie with the composer, and then you hear pieces, and then you give notes, and then you go to the recording, with the orchestra and you give notes and then you go to the mix and you give notes and it's a sort of like any part of the filmmaking process it's a process of exploration discovery and giving notes basically um, I've just had a unique experience with James Newton Howard where I gave notes but not as many as I normally do because he's especially gifted and um, but it's uh, for me music defines the soul of the film and the music has a profound impact on how we experience the story and the sound, quite frankly. And so it's always been hugely important for me and I've always been very involved in developing the score and shaping the score and influencing the score. Um, because I know a score can destroy a film and it can save a film. So it's that important. Um, and actually, bizarrely, in our industry what happens is the music is always the thing that happens at the end when there's hardly any money left. You know, so the composer comes in and it's like everyone else has spent their budgets and the composer has to kind of create a score in the last three months or two months or six weeks. And it's an industrial process that actually doesn't really work that well artistically for the movie. So what we did on Fantastic Beasts and what I did on Hallows is I, I asked James Newton Howard to start really early with us. So when I was shooting Beasts, James came to the set and he hung out for a bit and he watched takes and he met the actors. And we sat down together and we talked about the script and we talked about the story. And then he went back to California and he wrote a suite of music, not connected to the pictures at all. And he wrote, and it's about a 15 or 20 minute suite. And he sent it to me and he said, this is what I feel when I've read the script. This is what I feel when I met the actors. This is what I feel when we discuss the story. And out of that 15-minute suite was the basic DNA of our score. And, he, and then he spent seven months writing it. So, um, but James is very, you know, he's got a great team. And I found myself giving less notes to, to James than I've probably given to any other composer. I normally drive composers nuts. Um, and... We're not always on talking terms at the end of the process. Uh, but with James, it just felt like a natural partnership and a natural fit. And he's, he's done a beautiful score for Beasts, actually. That was, um, that most of those decisions are normally my decision, basically. So I, I sort of like, you know what I felt in the book? The book's great, because it happens in the Great Hall, doesn't it? And it happens in the Great Hall, and there's lots, oh, everybody's watching. So it becomes a sort of real melee. And, um, and that was a great sequence in the book. But I wanted it to be more singular. I wanted it to be about Dan and about Rafe. I wanted it to be, and I wanted it to have a sort of cleanness and a sort of landscape that felt more iconic. Um, and the thing is, when you have all those other characters sort of wandering around, you ask yourself, why doesn't anyone else get stuck in? Why doesn't anyone else start fighting? Why, doesn't, why don't they all gang up on Voldemort? And also Voldemort in the book, in that sequence, felt... Um, I, ju I just like the idea of him having a one-to-one -one with, with Dan. And the other thing that I introduced was the notion of, of Voldemort pulling him off the tower. And th because we'd started to develop this, this lovely notion that they were entwined in a way. Um, and so it just, it just felt right for, for Dan and Rafe to be in a very singular, singular place. And I know some people love it and some people hate it. Um, and I always, all of those decisions always get approved by Joe, basically. So she'll read the screenplay and she'll see it. And if there's anything that Joe goes, that doesn't feel right, we immediately change because um, it's her world fundamentally. 
and she was excited by that change and she embraced it so um, I just enjoyed this sort of one on one thing between the two great <laughs> I, um, you know what, it was a short film. I wrote and directed it. It was called When I Was a Girl. It wasn't autobiographical. It was... Um, <laughs> it was... Um, I shot it in black and white. I got a crew. I got a, a student crew from Bristol Film School. And I cast all the actors from the local community drama group. So it was a real... And my, my mum and dad, they both died when I was 20. They had lung cancer. So I lost them and they left me some money. And so, because my mum was always supportive of my filmmaking, I took this money and I invested it in that little short film. And it nearly killed me. Because it's, whatever, if there are any filmmakers here, or anyone who does any, anything, if you've directed theatre or, it's, it's an intense and brutal process making something. And, um, and what, what I loved about the process of making that movie was, the fact that you, I pulled together a group of people, everyone in that group really wanted to sort of do something interesting and ambitious because um, we were all starting out. And when you're all starting out together, there are no ceilings, there's no limit. It doesn't matter how little money you have, you're starting out. So you don't see boundaries, you just go for it. And, um, and, and I remember when I finished it, I was so knackered. And I was also despondent, actually, because I didn't think it was that good. I was so knackered, I was so despondent, I thought, oh man, I don't think this works at all. And I remember we had a little premiere for it in this little art cinema where we invited lots of people. And I sat in the projection booth and I was so tired, I actually sat down in the projection booth and just thought, I don't think this is gonna go well. And I didn't even watch the film. And they ran the film and when it came to the end, there was this amazing applause. And I thought, God, is that the film? And I got up and I looked through the little window and, and it connected with people. And I think it connected with people because, I think it connected with people because a lot of people have put a lot of love into it, a lot of time, a lot of commitment. Everybody, the actors, because it was their first film, the crew, because it was their second or third film, and me, because I had a lot to prove. And it was this chunk of money from my mum and dad. And it was make or break. It was make or break. If that film hadn't have worked, then that probably would have been the end of it, really. So, um, but it worked. And then I brought it to Cork, and the Cork Film Festival, it was such an interesting experience. Um, and Cork were very generous. And, that, and that's what really helped me start my career, I think. And similarly, at the Cork Film Festival, I wandered around for a couple of days, was a, decided to leave early, and they stopped me from leaving. They actually said, you can't go. And I said, why not? I said, well, we think you should stay around for the awards ceremony. And I said, why should I stay around for the awards ceremony? <laughs> and they said, well, you, you know, we might, uh, we might announce an award for your film. And so I, I stayed around and, and won an, uh, quite a big award for the film. And that got me into film school, you know. But the thing about making films is it, and anything in life, whatever we choose to do, whatever route we take, whatever career it is, I've discovered that <laughs> It's full of obstacles all the way along. No matter how successful you are, it's full of things that are going to stop you at any given point. And all those things that are there to stop you are there to really to build muscle, to give you strength, and to give you conviction in what you want to do. And so I was constantly failing as I progressed through my career. I was never getting the jobs I wanted to do. I never got the gigs I wanted to direct. I was always sort of being diverted this way or that way. But what I never did is I never gave up. I never gave up. I always believed that somehow I would, I would get where I needed to get. And all the little failures along the way ultimately guided me to the right place because I never gave up. And that's what you've got to do, keep going. Do you have any other questions? Um, <laughs> Yes. So yeah. 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 
I was trying to grow them up. I was trying to sort of make them, take, take, them, take them into a more mature space in a way and grow up with the kids. So the themes are a little bit darker and that less whimsical, uh, more intense. Um, so that was my, that was my responsibility is to bring them into a sort of more grown up world, if you like. Um, when I got the job, I was, I was directing, I got the job after directing a, a show called Sex Traffic. Bizarrely, it was an intense drama <laughs> for Channel 4. And I was directing Sex Traffic, I just delivered it, I finished it, and my agent called up and said, they want you to do Harry Potter. And I said, well, I've just done Sex Traffic and State of Play, why do they want me to do Harry Potter? <laughs> and um, it seemed like such an odd fit. And I went in to meet David Heyman, and he sat me down and he said, look, I just, you know, this world's gonna grow up now, and we need someone who can grow it up for us. We need someone who can make the material feel more mature and a bit more layered and a bit more serious sometimes. And that's why they hired me, actually. And that's why I came back for those other three films. So I, I kind of grew it up in a way, made it a little bit more intense. Lost some of the whimsy. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, right at the back. Yes. There was loads of things that I miss, you know. Um, you know, in the fifth book, the first movie I did, you know, there's a wonderful sequence in Grim Old Place, you know. Um, we, I mean, there, there are, I, ca I can't begin to tell you the things that I, I miss, um, which, and it was a process, it was a brutal, actually it was a brutal process as you started to sort of pull things out, because you realize that lots of people wanted to see them and um, and there just wasn't the room to do them. So you'd always have a list. You'd go through the list and go, I'd love to keep that, love to keep that, love to keep that, love to keep that. And then when you put it all in the screenplay, inevitably, it would have cost hundreds of millions of dollars and we couldn't quite do it. So um, you inevitably lost things. I loved, for example, I loved um, at the beginning of Hallows when the English prime minister's visited by, you know, um, the wizards and as something really, that was a cracking scene to open the movie. And it just, when we put it in, it just didn't feel right, so it came out again. Yeah. We have time for two more questions, maybe. Yeah, just right at the back. Yeah. Um, you mentioned one of the things about why people in Hollywood do your system. Yeah. I have a very good relationship with the studio I work for. Um, they're generally hands off, um, simply because I think because the Potter films were fairly successful. So when I joined them, they sort of like, they, they were very, um, yeah, they were very supportive, basically. Um, I don't think that's the norm. I think the norm is probably the opposite. So on Beasts and on Potter, there's been a fairly comfortable ride with them where they, they kind of, um, they had notes and they had issues that they sometimes weren't addressed. And there's a bit of, we, we just discuss, we never argue, but we always discuss fairly openly what's right, what's wrong. But generally they're very respectful and they, they encourage me to make the film that I want to make. And that's been the experience through all the potters and beasts as we've started. And I think the reason for that is because the films were successful to start with. I, I made a movie called The Legend of Tarzan, which I made while I was making Fantastic Beasts, um, alongside it in parallel, if you like. That was a slightly different experience because it wasn't Potter, it wasn't a built-in success. And we had a much more vigorous relationship about certain issues to do with the film. Um, but they were still fundamentally listen to any argument, and I still made the film I wanted to make. Um, my understanding, speaking to a lot of other directors, is that that's not the case, that studios generally can be a little bit more controlling. Um, and I've been very lucky, I've not experienced that. And I think that's because of the karma of Potter. They've sort of left me alone to a certain extent. Um, and I'm also very vigorous about defining what I think is important about the films and what makes them work. And so when they do suggest things that I don't think are helpful, 
I'll be very vigorous pushing it back. Um, and sometimes those discussions can be fairly intense, but I'll always hold the ground. And I don't think yet I've quite lost an argument on any one issue. They're always very respectful. Um, it'll be interesting to see how Beasts does when we open in November, if it's, if it's a, a, a success or not. Um, we're planning a second movie, which we start shooting next July. And depending on the success, will buy us our freedom or not, I think. You know, so um, at the moment, though, and I've worked with them for about eight years now, um, I, they've been terrific and supportive and encouraging. And I can say that all the films are my films, and I, I, don't, I don't feel I've had to change them for the sake of appeasing the studio. That's what I would say. But I don't think that's a very common experience for some directors working with big studios, from what I understand, speaking to other directors. We have time for one more question. Unique story. Um, <laughs> well, I can tell you that Eddie Redmayne, who plays Newt Scamander, um, is the most generous and the most um, graceful actor I've probably ever worked with. Um, I put him through the biggest audition of his life, um, not for him as an actor. I gave him the job straight away. I just said, hey, please be Newt Scamander. <laughs> um, and um, he immediately said yes. Um, and then I took him to New York and I put him in a room and I said, Eddie, I'm going to introduce you now to about 35 different actors and I want you to do the same scene with each one of them. And for about four days, Eddie auditioned opposite lots of different actors for the different roles, the different characters who were close to him in the movie. <coughs> because I knew by casting Eddie, I was kind of, he was the sort of fulcrum point ar around which to put everything else. Um, and Eddie did certain scenes like five or six times. And every time a different actor came in to audition with Eddie, Eddie was beyond generous. He sort of gave everything for that actor as if he wanted them. Because I know he was generous to everybody. He wanted everybody to have the best chance possible of getting that role. And. Um, and that sort of energy and that enthusiasm, that ambition never, never wavered for one minute. To the point that when we actually started to shoot that particular scene, say, on the real set, in the real schedule, it was really hard because he'd already done it a million times. And we had to change it to shake it up a bit to sort of allow him to sort of find something fresh within the material. <laughs> um, and that was like putting a band together. Those four characters, you wanted everyone to complement everybody else. But Eddie was, Eddie was a real gent and uh, very responsible in that process of putting the band together. Great, Great. so thanks so Lovely. much for uh, your Grace. time, David, and, and congratulations oh, on thank receiving you. The, Grace. Uh, the award. Shall I leave this here and come back in 15 years? <laughs> no, uh, I'll take it with you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, guys. Thank so you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so now we're going to ask everyone to please stand and give David a final round of applause. While I